Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at how humans threaten biodiversity for your AQA, A-level environmental science. Now this is a very, very important topic, it's very relevant to today's society and the things that are happening at the moment. So it is important that you get the facts straight, that you get them all sorted, to help you remember everything. Over my website there is a set of questions that you can try to remember to get everything into your long term memory, so it's there, ready and waiting for you in the exam. level environmental science. Topic 1. The living environment. Lesson 5. How humans threaten biodiversity. During this video we will be looking at the different ways in which human activity is threatening to reduce biodiversity across the world. The first category we can put threats into is direct exploitation. The use of the word direct means it involves using the organism themselves and we come into direct contact with them. For example, using animals as a food source is direct exploitation. This is through the large sectors of agriculture, fishing and aquaculture. We use a lot of plant, animal and fungi species as a food source and can often overexploit them, meaning we are taking them at a rate which is too fast for their populations to replenish themselves. Another direct exploitation is the use of materials in the fashion industry. This can be anything from fur, feathers or leather. We also take them from the wild and keep them as pets or for entertainment purposes. Thankfully, a lot of countries now have strict regulations on which exotic animals can and can't be kept as pets or in the entertainment industries, such as the circus. We use trees to make furniture or ornaments. Organisms such as elephants and rhinos are poached for their ivory, which is used to make all sorts of things, including piano keys. Traditional medicines also believe that some animal products can help with certain ailments and diseases. For example, using seahorses to treat infertility and baldness. It is important to feel confident in the difference between direct and indirect, as you will come across both these terms a lot throughout this course. Direct means that direct contact has been made, and indirect is where no direct contact has been made. For example, an indirect threat to an organism could be losing all of its food species due to a toxic chemical killing them all. The chemical has not come into direct contact with the organism, but has threatened them with starvation. Another human threat to biodiversity which we are seeing across the globe is the eradication of predators and competitor species, which are seen as pests or a danger to human society. There are lots of examples of a species being culled because they interfere with human activities. This can be any organisms that are seen as dangerous, so snakes or sharks, for example, as well as pathogen vectors that carry diseases, such as mosquitoes. Predators of livestock and herbivores of crops are culled as they threaten agricultural practices. This can lead to the complete eradication of these organisms in the wild. This was the case with the beavers, who used to be found throughout Britain. Beavers are ecosystem engineers that build dams, which in turn affects water flow rates and water levels. This was seen as a problem, as they can sometimes cause flooding or droughts along the river they are found in. Thankfully, there are now projects occurring throughout the UK to try and introduce them safely and utilise all of their benefits that they bring to a habitat. An example of this is the Woodland Valley site in Cornwall. Another threat we are going to look at is habitat destruction. It is important in the exam that you don't just write habitat destruction unqualified. You must always give an example of destruction. Generally, Humans destroy habitats as a result of land use change. Deforestation is a perfect example of this. Trees are chopped down for multiple reasons, usually because they are in the way and the land needs to be used for something else, such as agriculture or mining. Large areas tend to be deforested at once, which causes population fragmentation of species found there. Another example of habitat destruction is the ploughing of grassland. Humans need to plough to aerate the soil and make it more suitable to growing crops, but of course, this will kill the grass species. Reservoir creation involves the flooding of an area and the building of a dam. 
This is then used as a drinking water resource. By flooding the area, all non-aquatic species will be less likely to survive there. And as the human population is increasing exponentially, this is being done more often because we need more houses and more hospitals. This is called urban expansion, where cities and towns are growing bigger to accommodate all the new people. Of course, all of these things could be done more sustainably. Deforestation could be done sustainably by using selective logging instead of clearing a whole area. This will have a reduced impact on the habitat. Agricultural practices can be made more sustainable by using low tillage farming, which works around the concept of moving the soil as little as possible, so minimal, if any, ploughing. Reservoir creation can be made less damaging by choosing a semi-aquatic site so organisms can still survive after the habitat change. Next, we are going to look at biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors are anything living that could affect an organism's survival. Some examples are competitors and herbivores, for example. An abiotic factor is something non-living that can affect an organism's survival. Examples of this would be temperature, pH, or the amount of rainfall, for example. Here are more examples of biotic and abiotic factors. Firstly, we are going to focus on abiotic factors that are under threat or changing due to human activities and therefore threatening organisms across the globe. The most vulnerable organisms are those with a narrow range of tolerance, which means if they are moved out of their conditions, they will die. An example of this is coral reefs. They require very specific conditions in order to survive, such as warm water temperatures and high light levels. If either of these things change even slightly, it can cause them to die. Water availability can be affected by so many human activities. For example, water availability might decrease in a habitat due to over-abstraction for drinking water or draining land to build on. On the other hand, Water levels may increase if an area becomes flooded to create a reservoir and will no longer be suitable for the organisms that were living there. Dissolved oxygen levels in the water is also important, as aerobic organisms in the water rely on it for respiration. There is an inverse relationship between temperature and dissolved oxygen in water. This means that the higher the temperature, the lower the concentration of dissolved oxygen. Water temperature can be increased if factories or power stations release hot water into nearby water sources, killing aerobic organisms living there. Furthermore, the temperature change itself could also be devastating for species found there. Species are adapted to a range of temperatures, but unfortunately, due to global climate change, we are seeing temperature rises in many habitats across the globe. This can cause species to range shift to a new area to try and return to their previous temperature, but this is not always possible as the temperature they need may no longer be available anywhere. If a range shift is successful and the organism can survive in a new area, this might also cause problems as they could outcompete or predate on native species to that area and disrupt the natural food chain. Dissolved oxygen levels can also be reduced in a water body by the process of eutrophication. Eutrophication is when inorganic fertiliser leaches out of soil that it has been applied to and runs off across the soil into nearby water. When it reaches the water, the fertiliser stimulates the growth of algae, causing an algal bloom on the surface, which blocks sunlight from penetrating the water. As a result, any submerged plants are going to die as they are not getting any light to photosynthesise. An increase in dead plants in the water means there is an increase in microbes decomposing the dead organic matter aerobically, taking oxygen out the water as they do so. As dissolved oxygen levels decrease, more organisms will die, so more decomposers will be present taking more oxygen out of the water until aerobic organisms can no longer survive. If left untreated, this process can result in a dead zone, which is completely anoxic, where there is zero oxygen, where nothing aerobic can survive. pH is another important abiotic factor that, if changed, can kill organisms as it can stop their enzymes from working by denaturing them. 
Enzymes are responsible for many cellular processes, such as cell replication and digestion, without which an organism cannot survive. Organisms with calcium carbonate exoskeletons, such as crayfish, are particularly vulnerable to pH changes, as their shells can be dissolved by an acidic pH. Turbid water is water that is opaque or cloudy rather than clear due to sediment or pollutant buildup. The turbidity of water is an important abiotic factor as it reduces the amount of light that can penetrate the water surface, which as discussed in eutrophication, can kill submerged plants as they can no longer photosynthesize. Humans increase turbidity through construction and agriculture, releasing sediment or soil into nearby water sources. The final example of abiotic factors we are going to look at is physical damage, which can be caused by any rubbish that is discarded by humans. For example, plastics in the ocean can entangle and suffocate sea creatures such as turtles. Discarded fishing gear can cause ghost fishing, which can trap organisms, resulting in their death. Discarded litter throughout the environment can be mistaken for food and be consumed. Just as humans can alter the abiotic factors in an environment, we can also change the biotic features too. Remember, this is anything that is living. One of the main components that we impact are the food chains. We call something called a trophic cascade. An example of a trophic cascade might be that we overfish a certain prey species of a shark, and as a result, that shark species also declines as they have less food available to them. Depending on the food chain and the species involved, humans can cause both increases and declines in a population. Not only this, but humans can cause the decline in keystone species, a species that has a large role in its environment, such as pollinators and seed dispersers. Pollinating insects are often killed by toxic pesticides that we use on our crops, and large seed dispersers, such as gorillas and elephants, are endangered mostly due to habitat destruction. Another way in which humans alter the biotic features of an environment is the introduction of new species. An introduced species would be non-native to the area, but it may have a competitive advantage over the native species found there, causing a decline in the original community numbers. The introduced species could become invasive, which is where they dramatically alter the habitat they have been introduced into. An introduced species could be multiple things. An introduced predator, which may start hunting a native species and causing huge declines in their numbers. Isolated oceanic islands species are particularly vulnerable to this, as they do not have the instincts to avoid predators, as they haven't ever come into contact with them before. This could of course then cause a trophic cascade elsewhere in the food chain on that island. The species could be an introduced pathogen, carried by an introduced species or by humans into an environment. Many tree pathogens have been introduced into the UK over the years due to the import of timber, such as sudden oak death disease. Grey squirrels being introduced is another great example as they were vectors, carriers, for squirrel pox disease, which they transmitted to the red squirrels, killing them without being infected themselves. A key cause of introduced species is the shipping trade, where large ships take in a ballast water from their origin port and store into their ballast tank to help with buoyancy. There could be all manner of sea creatures in this water, from bacteria to invertebrates. They then set sail to their destination port and release their ballast water with all the creatures inside. If the ports are of a similar climate and habitat, then the creatures in the ballast water may thrive there and become an introduced predator, competitor or pathogen. One last possible impact of introducing a species is that they could hybridise with a native species. Hybridisation essentially means they will mate with the native species, creating offspring that are hybrids of the two species. For this to happen, the two species must be closely related. A good example to illustrate this is the introduction of domestic cats in Scotland, which are breeding with Scottish wildcats, creating a hybrid. We are seeing fewer pure-breed Scottish wildcats, which threatens their population. Another way in which humans can alter the biotic features of an environment is by threatening species known as ecosystem engineers. 
These can be described as species that drastically alter the environment. They can change the abiotic features of a habitat, which other species then come to rely on for their survival. Without the engineers, then the habitat features will change and no longer can be suitable for lots of other species. A good example of this is African elephants, which create clearings and watering holes that other species rely on, and the beavers that we previously mentioned. You should now have a good selection of threats to biodiversity that you could talk about in detail in the exam. Remember, a species may not just be facing one threat, it is more likely that they will be facing multiple at once, so don't get thrown off if they present multiple to you in the same question in an exam. Ouch! This is when somebody I explain scratches.